the connection is my connection okay i hope i think it should be fine What time is in Texas right now? Is it early morning? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's eight o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock? Uh-huh. So not too early. And it's the end of your day there, I guess. Okay, I think we can start. Dear colleagues, welcome to the last session of our conference. This is a plenary session. And I'm happy to introduce our plenary speaker, Patience Epps, a professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Patty received her PhD in linguistics, linguistic anthropology from the University of Virginia in 2005. She has worked mainly on indigenous languages of Amazonia. Her dissertation, A Grammar of Hook, this is an endangered language of the Nadu Hook family, won the Panini Award of the Association for Linguistic Typology and was later published in the Mouton Grammar Library series. Uh, currently, Patty is co editing an international handbook on Amazonian languages in four volumes. Um, the topics of Patty's research and publications include language documentation, description and preservation, linguistic typology and historical linguistics, language contact and convergence, and also linguistic anthropology and verbal art. All these topics are highly relevant for our forum. Today's talk, will present Amazonian perspectives on specialized discourse and language change. Amazonia and South America in general is an area which has not yet been covered during our forum. So I'm sure we will be happy to learn more about this right now. Uh, a few years ago, Patty visited Russia as a lecturer at the Summer School for Aerial Linguistics. Today we meet via Zoom. Uh, thank you, Patty, for accepting our invitation to give a plenary talk at the forum. Uh, the floor is now yours. Please, you can start. So thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the invitation to be here with you, um, even by Zoom. And I hope that in the future, we'll be able to convene in person in happier times. Um, I'll begin by sharing my screen. So just one moment. Okay. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? Does it look all right? Yes, it's okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, let me just make sure that it covers all the text. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so again, thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'll begin by um, observing that if in a, thinking about the theme of this conference on um, traditional speech forms and practices and thinking about the relationship between um, such traditional forms and and processes of language change and variation that shape languages over time. So the relationship between those things. Um, and it's I think it's fairly clear that most of our theories of language variation and change as they've been um, assembled over the years have tended to prioritize everyday speech, especially um, as it's accessed by child learners and tend to be grounded in the study of mo monolingual contexts. But um, as for many societies around the world, it's the, 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 the truth is that there are a range of discourse forms and practices that are salient and ubiquitous. And these include specialized genres and registers that aren't necessarily taken into account very frequently in thought, thinking about language variation and change. It's also the case that small scale multilingual contexts have probably been the norm throughout much of human history as explored by Lupke and Evans. Um, and by small scale multilingual contexts, we mean heteroglossic societies where multilingual interaction is not governed by domain specialization and hierarchical relationships um, as Federica Lupke has defined it. Um, so it's a truism that the dynamics of language change are anchored in the innovation and the propagation of new variants, but we still have a lot to learn about what these processes involve. So what encourages the emergence of some innovations, but not others? And what determines which innovations will be attended to and replicated? And to what extent are the relevant processes likely to apply universally, um, as opposed to being anchored in locally specific sociocultural practices and systems of knowledge, including traditional speech forms and practices, which could be potentially more variable across regions and cultures. So part of what I'm asking here in this, these questions is what is the relevance and the potential variability of the socially marked? And by socially marked, we suppose that um, something might be more likely to be picked up and replicated in processes of language change. So as has been observed by many people, linguistic processes are also social processes. And in thinking about language variation and change, key social variables that have been identified include gender, age, socioeconomic class, but there are other possible variables as well, such as clan or ceremonial role, which again, as, as I'll discuss here, may intersect in interesting ways with traditional speech forms and practices. There are also key social dynamics that are associated with language variation and change. So what is the loci of innovation and propagation for change? So are these child learners versus adults? To what extent are they both implicated? What are the types of networks? Um, that may be involved, and what are the social variables that may Im be implicated in the nodes of these networks? So as Bayer et al. put it, discourse is the matrix for linguistic diffusion, And but what do we mean by discourse? So everyday conversation versus more socially marked discourse forms. So a point that I'll be um, emphasizing in this talk is that social variables, structures, and discursive forms, and thereby processes of contact and change are inextricably grounded in local communities of practice and are informed by particular ontologies and ideologies. So in this talk, I'm gonna explore the view that relatively specialized discourse forms and particular social categories that are associated with these forms may offer a significant, but potentially a quite variable locus for innovations to emerge and to propagate, and particularly those involving contact with other languages in small-scale multilingual settings. So indigenous Amazonia is a really interesting place to investigate these questions um, for several reasons. So first of all, there's a range of what are in many cases still ethnographically observable small-scale social contexts, contexts 
with interaction among diverse languages and lects. And in many cases, there are also still vibrant or at least still well-remembered traditions of specialized discourse that are anchored in locally grounded belief systems and that afford a key role to shamans and other ritual specialists. So here's the plan of my talk. Um, so I'll first look at specialized discourse and how it relates to multilingualism and innovation, and then turn to thinking about how specialized discourse relates also to propagation. So a focus of my talk is the area of the upper Rio Negro region in the Northwest Amazon. And this is the area where I've been doing field work for many, many years. Well, many, many, about 20 years now. Um, this is a really interesting area. It's been described as a regional system. So it's, as can be seen here in the map, it's very multilingual in the sense of just having many, many languages represented in the region. Um, these languages belong to multiple language families as well. And it's, it, we can see the, the Rio Negro region as a kind of microcosm of a broader Amazonian linguistic diversity as is reflected in the map on the right, where the colors represent language families. So the actual number of languages is even more diverse than this. And from the perspective of language families, Amazonia is um, next to New Guinea, the most diverse place in the world, or as far as we as far as we know. Um, so this is a region where small scale multilingualism is well attested. There's been um, quite a bit of of um, of maintenance and conservation of um, of traditional speech forms and practices. Um, many of these discourse forms are now pretty endangered in the region, but they're still. Um, even where they're not not uh, extensively practiced today, there's still regions where they're practiced and there tend to be um, elders who remember them pretty well. So there's still a lot of op opportunity to document them. Um, and in this region, not only do we have many different languages, so multilingualism in the regional sense, but we also have um, a lot of multilingualism on the part of individual speakers. So here's a, a schema that lays out some of the different groups that interact and are multilingual in various ways. Um, so as is fairly well known from the work of um, Alexandra Eichenwald and other colleagues, um, um, Janet Trinella, Jean Jackson, other colleagues, um, the East Tucanoan peoples of this region have interacted for a long time, um, long before the, the Europeans arrived, by um, according to the practice of linguistic exogamy, where um, one is required to marry somebody who comes from a group that identifies with a different language. Um, the reality, of course, of linguistic exogamy is that children are brought up in communities where the men identify with the community language, but all of the unmarried women identify with different languages and very frequently speak them. So children end up being highly multilingual um, in terms of their, their linguistic capacity, even though they identify primarily with one language. Among the Arawakan groups in the region, Teriana is um, involved in this exogamy system. The other languages tend to be more peripheral with respect to this marriage system and marry a lot amongst themselves, um, but also intermarry and interact extensively with other groups in the region. There's another division in the region um, between people who are um, focused more on agriculture and live by major rivers, and those are the Tucanoan and Arawakan peoples. And then we have the people who are more associated with the interfluvial forest zones and prioritize hunting, and those are the Nadahoop and the Kakuanukak peoples. Um, the Nadahoop and Kakuanukak, these forest peoples, don't normally engage in linguistic exogamy either amongst themselves or with the other riverine groups. Um, but they have been engaged for, again, for a very, very long time, apparently, um, in institutionalized exchange involving their river-dwelling neighbors um, with somewhat lower social status, which involves unreciprocated bilingualism, primarily today, at least, in Tucanoan languages. Um, 
so but very stable from what we can tell at least throughout history all of these groups also interact frequently in ritual and ceremonial activities so the linguistic outcomes of this all of this interaction are very interesting um, and have been described um, you know, ex fairly extensively at this point um, and that they are associated with quite low levels of lexical borrowing so somewhat surprisingly low given the um, the intensity and time depth of this interaction um, but at the same time high grammatical convergence so for a time that seemed very surprising in light of the literature on language contact, but I think now that we know more about small scale linguistic, uh, small scale multilingual communities and the kinds of interaction that that shape them, along with language maintenance, um, those outcomes seem somewhat less surprising. So my own research has focused on the Navajo peoples, which are here outlined in red. Um, this is a small language family of, of the of interfluvial um, foraging focused people, although they also have some agriculture. Um, and the family's made up of these four languages, Nadabdo, Hoop, and Yuhoop. Um, my work has engaged with Hoop for the longest time. That was a subject of my dissertation. Um, but I've also worked more recently on Do and am currently working on Nadab. So the importance of network structures in the diffusion of change is well known. Um, and in multilingual contexts, like those of the Upper Rio Negro, networks are also key for in introducing contact-driven innovations. So as Milroy and Milroy put it, the diffusion of change is accomplished by individuals who have many ties within the close-knit community and who also have a relatively large number of outside contacts. In small scale multilingual contexts, um, social networks are likely to regularly include speakers of other languages and lex. And when thinking about specialized discourse or traditional speech forms and practices, um, a key feature of this kind of discourse, as I'll argue here, is its proneness to replication. And in multilingual context, this means it's a locus for contact-driven innovations to emerge, and then from there to propagate. So in considering the relationship between multilingual networks and discourse, the Rio Negro offers some really interesting opportunities to, to explore this topic. And one of the really striking aspects of, of um, you know, indigenous life in this region is that there are very closely similar stories, songs, incantations, and all kinds of discourse forms that occur across the region, um, even though, of course, they're occurring in different languages, which are in some cases unrelated. So I'll look at a few examples of those um, to illustrate. So one example is um, of kind of dyadic drinking songs. And these tend to be exchanged between women at festivals where often where different communities may come together. In some cases, communities, in, in many cases in this region, in fact, communities who are associated with different languages or primarily speak different languages. Um, and the context for these is different kinds of, of ceremonial uh, festivities where groups um, engage in drinking a lot of manioc beer, and um, you have women who face off together in these dyads and sing these songs. So I will play a little piece of one. Um, I hope that the sound level will be okay. <laughs> Okay, so you get a, a sense of what it sounds like. Now, looking at the text of these songs, here is an example that comes from work by the anthropologist Janet Chernella 
um, who focus on Koteria or Wanano, which is one of the East Tucanoan groups, on the genre of song called Kayabasa or sad songs. And the things I'd like to highlight in this text are the, the themes that are um, highlighted here in colors. So there's a theme of passing through, a theme of wandering, a theme of mixing, um, a theme of self-deprecation. So simple, like a horsefly, ugly, detested, hated. And this genre is associated with the fact that women are married into communities. They leave their natal communities um, and marry into a group where you know, they don't identify with the language um, and they're, they don't always have strong kin networks. Um, but as we'll see, in fact, this genre goes well beyond the linguistic exogamy system in the region um, and may in fact have originated with Arawakan peoples who don't practice linguistic exogamy, although they practice, you know, all of the groups are exogamous in some way or another. Um, so I'll play again a, a snip of this song and, and you can see the, um, get a sense of the melody as well in this case. So all of these songs, one of the things that they tend to share that you'll hear across these, these recordings is um, a tendency to switch back and forth between a high register, a falsetto register, and a lower register. Um, so this one, let me play this, make sure it's not too loud. Okay, so now we can look at um, a version of the same genre or a song from the same genre um, as performed in a hoop community, in this case by Ana Salustiano, who's pictured right here in this photograph. Um, and what I want to highlight here is, of course, this is a different language, this is hoop rather than quotidia. But as you can see, this is also a community that doesn't practice linguistic exogamy. It practices various, people tend to move between communities when they get married, but it's not nearly as rigid as it is in Tucanoan communities. Um, but nevertheless, you can see the same kinds of themes here. So these really are hallmarks of this genre, passing through, mixing in, um, forms of self-deprecation. And you can see in the melody as well, oops, there are some similarities. So that's one genre, dyadic drinking songs. Um, now I want to look briefly at another genre. So in the case of um, so again, as in the case of the dyadic drinking songs, when we look at traditional stories, we see again a kind of replication of the same stories throughout this you know, many different groups in this region, um, but of course told in different languages. So a, a story that we find in multiple um, sets of documentation from different parts of this region is this one that begins this way. So there's a lost hunter. He spends the night in the forest. A spirit known as a Kurupira finds his shelter that he built and speaks to him through the wall, demanding parts of his body to eat. So obviously the man doesn't want to give him parts of his body to eat. So instead he cuts off pieces of the monkeys that he shot and passes them out to the Kurupira saying that these are parts of his own flesh and the Kurupira eats them. And then so I don't, I hope this isn't too small to see, but this, these two pieces of text are simply to illustrate that in the Kotiria version as recorded by Chris Stenzel and in the hoop, a hoop version as recorded by myself, the, what the, the, the pattern of these stories, the plot that they follow, the events that are described are almost identical. So in both cases, um, the man, finishes giving the pieces of meat to the Kurupira, it's getting to be day, and then the, the man says to the, the spirit, now you give me your heart to eat, since I've been feeding you pieces of myself. And here the Kurupira says, oh, well, uh, okay, but how did you take out your heart? 
the man says, well, you just take this knife and you just stick it in yourself <laughs> and cut out your heart. So the Kurupira tries to do this and of course he dies and the man succeeds in, in escaping. But again, the, just an illustration that these stories are very, very similar. So all of this shared discourse um, can of course be expected to translate into other kinds of shared features. So discourse norms, how you tell a story in addition to the, the plot itself of given stories or songs um, is also something that we see uh, mirrored throughout the region. So here is a little piece of um, a story from Kotiria again, compared to Hoop. And here we can take Kotiria as a sample that represents a number of other East Tukanoan languages in the region, um, but it's one of the best documented. Um, so here, the colors here represent that you have these processes of head tail claws linkage, where, <laughs> excuse me, where a sentence repeats the, the previous part that, that came before of the sentence before. Um, so here the snake came quickly in a canoe, having come quickly. So that's the head tail claws linkage. Another thing that's, that's repeated consistently is a reported evidential and um, reference to the distant past where these are in hoop, at least these are relatively optional grammatically, but in this discourse genre, they appear very, very regularly. And we'll come back to that point later. So very similar kinds of discourse norms get repeated. So not only do we see genres, themes, and styles spread throughout the region, but also specific discursive structures that themselves blend into grammatical structures and categories, as we will come back to. So in this region, there's a widespread emphasis on multilingual repertoires in ceremonial contexts, even where daily interaction is largely monolingual. Um, not in the Northwest Amazon, a lot of daily interaction is multilingual, but more widely in Amazonia, there are other zones where many languages are represented. And even in cases where the daily interaction is primarily in a single language, um, and in parts of the Northwest Amazon, it's the same thing. Um, when you get into ceremonial context, you see a locus for even more multilingualism in the repertoires that are involved. So a couple of examples from different parts of the Amazon basin. In the upper Shingu, there's a whole series of song genres um, and spells that combine Arawak and Carib, so language components from different families, in fact. Um, and are not always interpretable to the singers themselves who are not necessarily speakers of those languages, but nevertheless, the songs combine them. In lowland Ecuador, shamanic practice specifically references um, foreign languages. Um, and they're often described to be languages associated with different groups of people, um, whether or not they're in fact a precise replication of those, those words and whether or not people are actually multilingual in those languages. In the Rio Negro region, there's an interesting example of a ritual song genre called the Capiwaya, or regionally known as the Capiwaya, where it's performed in hoop uh, communities, in Tukanoan communities, in Kakwa communities. It seems to be quite widespread around the region. Um, it's performed in a language that isn't interpretable or intelligible to the people of that community. Although the specialists who sing the songs can often deliver a kind of rough translation, but it appears that that translation is learned along with the song rather than being something that they can interpret directly from the words. Um, here is an example of this genre sung by Enrique Monteiro, who unfortunately died a number of years ago, but it was a very, very knowledgeable elder in um, one of the hoop communities where I spent a lot of time. Yeah, 
Nubidu kai, nubidu ngari jatimariya eru. So my point here is that in addition to providing a platform for the replication of discourse, discursive genres and styles, specialized discourse, um, at least in the Amazonian context, is likely to highlight the wholesale replication of languages. And in fact, if we look at the Kapiwaya, this opaque ritual language if, uh, that's, that's uh, associated just with the song genre, we find that in fact, words that frequently come up in the Kapiwaya look like they have an Arawakan source. And so here are some Arawakan parallels of words that are very frequent in the hoop Kapiwaya that I've documented. So marie, no marie, pi marie, this word is ubiquitous across Kapiwaya songs throughout the region and is associated with the white egret feather in Arawakan languages. Um, which it's, is, is itself an important term in Arawakan versions of songs that are very similar to this, where the, the language is actually not opaque. Um, and it's a reference to Kuai, which is a, a major Arawakan deity, and a version of Kuai is also recognized throughout the whole region. Um, there's also reference to what appears to be Kapi, ayahuasca, words associated with jaguar, Here's another example of, this is a version of a Kapiwaya song that was recorded um, from a Tucano um, elder um, documented by his own son who wrote um, one of the first PhD theses um, defended by an indigenous Amazonian person in the region. So it was a really wonderful milestone. Um, and this thesis was a exploration of the traditional knowledge um, that he, um, gained by documenting it with members of his own family. So this is um, the Kapiwaya song here in this text here on the left. This is the loose translation below it that the, the singer gave. Now the time has come, we'll finish off all the jaguars. You must pay attention, try to flee immediately, exiting by some hole in the wall of the house. So I just took that text and sat down with a a dictionary of a regional Arawakan language, in this case, Baniwa. And sure enough, many of these words look like they could easily have an Arawakan source. And the form of the word, not only does the form of the word correspond to the form that turns up in this Kapiwaya song, but the meanings are consistent with the free translation that the um, singer offered. So here we have a word for house, a word for hide, word for hole, word for wall, wait or pay attention, jaguar, and so on. So it seems pretty clear that the Kapiwaya genre probably originated among Arawakan groups, spread across the region, but crucially, this is one genre where it's copied directly the language as well, as opposed to being just translated into the recipient languages, um, and it's a place where Arawakan words are, you know, used in the, the context of these other communities, even when in this case they're not speakers of the language. So, in addition to these types of replication, specialized discourse provides fertile ground for more fine-grained manipulation of language that often involves contact elements. So, very widely around the world, it's it's observed that ritual and ceremonial discourse in particular provide a context in which different languages may intertwine and which difference itself may be stretched and manipulated. In Amazonia, we can see that linguistic diversity that's in place widely in this region um, provides a high potential for multilingual exchange and an explicit association between otherness and shamanic power is also relevant in um, emphasizing the importance of other languages in specifically in ceremonial discourse. Um, shamanic and ceremonial registers in Amazonia, but also beyond, um, moreover, tend to rely heavily on lexical substitution involving metaphorical expressions, but also components from other languages. So again, um, the ceremonial registers and shamanic discourse and ceremonial discourse provide a context by which um, we're likely to see 
um, bits of other languages entering the, the interactive um, context here. So another point that is important to emphasize is that ritual specialists themselves, people who are masters of traditional discourse forms, may be particularly key agents of innovation and propagation within the larger universe of specialized discourse and its practitioners. So ritual and shamanic experience and expertise, moreover, in these societies tends to be distributed across a given community, not just limited to a few individuals. So widely in the Amazon region, shamanic training involves apprenticeships and interactions with other ritual specialists, including those belonging to different ethnic and linguistic groups. And there are many examples of this in the literature. I've encountered people in the Rio Negro who are you know, on their way to study with a shaman somewhere in a different area. Um, and moreover, cures themselves or shamanic practices can be conceptualized, as Oakdale puts it, conceptualized as a way of making alliances and forming networks of relations, expanding social relationships and sociability. But it's again, it's important to emphasize that this shamanic expertise is often not just localized within a few people in this in a given community, but in fact can be some ver some form of shamanic expertise can be quite widely shared. So you have the potential in ceremonial discourse of this kind, you have the potential for replication, but also a really important potential for creativity. So social roles that are associated with ritual and shamanic practice involve both replication and creativity. And as Hugh Jones has put it, shamanism is like acting or playing music. Received knowledge and training combines with originality, skill, and performance. To know what you're saying and doing, you must learn from others, but to be any good, you must add something of yourself. And as Niera puts it, shamanic ritual texts should be seen as macro-political yet individual performances. So my argument is that this kind of discourse specifically provides a, a particularly robust context for contact-driven and other kinds of innovations to emerge and to be propagated. And we'll turn to the question of propagation next. So thinking about how innovations may arise and be particularly um, that, that ceremonial discourse and specialized discourse may be particularly fertile ground, but also fertile ground for their getting picked up and spread among a wider population. So how might this happen? Um, the social role of ritual specialists is relevant both not only to innovation, but to propagation. And emphasizing the social role, um, we can point out that in Amazonia and you know, presumably to some degree much more widely in the world, ritual specialists, which include shamans, but are not necessarily um, limited to shamans, tend to occupy key social positions. So they tend to be associated with diffuse networks. So as we've seen in the Amazonian context, shamans tend to go move widely, engage with different entities. In fact, that's really the essence of the shamanic ability is to engage with different worlds, whether they be metaphysical or sometimes in anchored in the ground in this world. So basically by virtue of being a shaman, they're associated with diffuse networks. They also tend to be older and established members of the community, usually male, and they often had extensive kin structures. And their authority also derives from their capacities as orators, political and legal brokers, and for their power to harness the spiritual world for healing or harming. So effectively, these are individuals who not only are plugged into very diffuse networks, but are in positions of authority and um, and, you know, are maybe very likely to be looked to as models of, of proper behavior on the part of other people living in their communities. So, therefore, we get the potential for creativity to lead to further replication on the part of people, other people in the community. So, 
specialized discourse forms. Um, so part of the fact that that these are looked to in many cases as as good examples of kind of important ways to speak or proper ways to speak is that even though specialized discourse forms um, may be creative and individually stamped, they also in many cases emphasize conservative elements. So in ceremonial discourse and shamanic discourse and so forth in the Amazon, we often see formulaic components, retention of archaisms and so forth. And of course, discourse with elders or discourse associated with elders um, very widely, not just in the Amazon, is often viewed as a model of correct speech, as Eichenwald has put it for Teriana, and is thus prone to copying. Um, and as I've mentioned before, it's also key that much of Amazonian specialized discourse is not the exclusive property of a few individuals. So it's not like one priest in a big city who might speak Latin. It's It tends to be more distributed knowledge. Um, and so this, this knowledge of this specialized discourse tends to be passed on to segments of the population. And moreover, genres and registers tend not to be hermetically sealed such that they can creep into other discourse forms and even everyday speech. So they allow for both direct and indirect copying. <clears throat> So the argument that I would propose here is that a this provides a kind of recipe, not only for innovations to emerge, but also for them to be readily propagated. So how do we get from the realm of, of you know, sort of theory to, to reality? Um, in, in how do we effectively track the spread of innovations within specialized discourse and out into everyday language? which is really the proof of concept for this argument that I'm proposing here. Um, the first word on this is that it's a very large challenge. Um, for many small scale multilingual contexts, we still have limited understanding of the variation that exists across speakers, genres, registers, and styles, and limited historical corpora. So actually being able to point to a, a form that's that's distributed throughout the language and say this emerged through specialized discourse is very, very difficult to do. So I'm this is more of a of an invitation for to other people to look for these kinds of things than it is um an a, a then I have the I don't have the capacity to to totally nail this down. Um, but I will show a few examples that I think are very suggestive of this kind of transition. Um, and again, invite others to, to look for it. So specialized discourse and lexical change. So beginning with what might happen in the lexicon. Um, one area where we see an association between specialized discourse and the lexicon involves avoidance practices where these tend to call for lexical substitution. Um, so in Amazonia, it's very widely observed that there's a prevalence of lexical substitution or circumlocation of different kinds that involve game, animal, and hunting terms and spiritually significant concepts. And a really interesting point is that in many cases, the kinds of lexical manipulations that are used to um, substitute for a, a lexical item that's being avoided, that's in some way taboo or dangerous or whatever, um, the kinds of strategies for this lexical manipulation are often very, very similar to what we see in shamanic registers, effectively the same sorts of strategies. And these tend to be consistent with wider trends around the world that link lexical replacement to avoidance strategies um, anchored in culturally specific discourse practices in some cases. So it's not unusual around the world that we get lexical replacement that's due to some sort of taboo thing. Um, but the parallel in Amazonia that I'm really pointing out is the, the similarity between the strategies that are used and the strategies that are relevant to shamanic discourse and specialized discourse relating to um, how a new form is, is coined to, to be substituted. So here's an example of um, 
of uh, terms for caiman in Do, where there's a generic word chet, meaning caiman, but then there are three alternative terms that can be used that appear to derive from the hunting register, from a kind of hunting register or associated with a kind of hunting register. So one where the source is unknown, and then one where that's cognate with lizard in the sister languages. So a caiman is like a crocodile or an alligator, um, if, if you're not familiar with it. Um, <clears throat> so similarity to lizard in the sister languages makes certain sense. And then there's another um, collocation that translates to the one with ridges, or you know, ridges that stand up on the skin. Um, and again, these sorts of, of collocations where we see different words that might be associated with other languages or kind of metaphorical substitutions are things that are very, very frequently encountered in shamanic discourse as well, but are you know more, uh, they're not necessarily established more widely in the language. Um, and it's also the case in some languages where these different synonym sets that are associated with the hunting registers seem to offer a set of synonyms that might become more accessible to um, to everyday discourse and can sometimes end up replacing the original word in that language. Another observation relates to um, calcing and, and borrowing of flora and fauna terms. So um, I've been working on a long-term study looking at um, lexical borrowing across a large number of Amazonian languages and um, you know trying to take uh, the same uh, comparable word word lists and compare them across a really large number of languages in order to have um, a more controlled comparison. And one of the <laughs> one of the findings that emerges from this work is that even though it seems that that in general, the maintenance of a lot of languages in Amazonia, tends to correspond with not a lot, not a, a great deal of lexical borrowing. Um, nevertheless, the lexical borrowing that does occur tends to be um, very, very heavy in the flora fauna domains or relatively heavy in the flora fauna domains. Um, so the flora fauna domain is represented by this red line here in this, in this chart. Um, so why would this be? Well, it's very difficult to say for sure. Um, one idea, albeit somewhat speculative, is that um, the kinds of hunting registers that we just looked at and other kinds of, um, of associations of flora and fauna with cosmological salience of those entities might be relevant to um, driving those loans. And this has been explicitly um, proposed by in some studies of loans in certain languages in the Amazon. So work by Melendez on um, loan words in Sikwani, which is a Guahiban language. Um, he notes that the flora and fauna loans from Arawakan languages are very high in Sikwani compared to other domains and points out explicitly here that um, there seems to be, this correlates at least with the importance of these animals and plants in the cosmology and mythology of the, the community. So we even see this among Vandeverter or really widespread loans in Amazonia. So um, here are two examples of particularly widespread edema. So this symbol here is a way of indicating that this is a, a, a an edamon that takes some form like amana um, which varies from language to language, but is identifiable as effectively the same edamon. And you can see some form resembling amana, that means dolphin, is very, very widely spread um, in among Amazonian languages. Likewise, a form wakara, meaning egret or heron. And we've already seen the importance of the egret in um, the spiritual discourse or ceremonial discourse and the spiritual traditions of um, peoples in the Northwest Amazon. So I would imagine that there's a relationship there, especially given the fact that Arawakan peoples are so widely distributed throughout the, Ara at the Amazon basin. Another relevant point is that in HOOP, if we compare flora and fauna terms, binomial flora and fauna terms in HOOP with those in, neighbor in related languages like though, 
we can see and with with neighboring languages like Tucano, we can we can build an argument that the hoop binomial flora and fauna terms appear effectively to have been directly calped from Tucano. So the fact that there this inga is a kind of, of tree that bears edible pods, um, seed pods where you can eat the inside of the pod. Um, and there's many different kinds of inga. They're associated with all of these, these names associated with different animals. Um, in some cases, there's you could say there's a kind of reason for this in the sense that this squirrel monkey inga, squirrel monkeys really like to eat it. But I think it's pretty obvious that the parallels here are not accidental or they're not they're not independent, not likely to be independent. And sure enough, if we compare Do, which is Hoop's sister language, um, we see very little overlap in these binomial terms. So again, why would you get so much binomial calcing of these binomial flora fauna terms? And again, one possible explanation um, and again, somewhat speculative, given that it's very difficult to actually catch this in action. But one possible explanation is that shamanic incantation in this region is, um, is essentially built on the elaboration of flora fauna sets, which means creating as fine-grained sets of different types of flora and fauna as possible, which means elaborating these terms um, as, you know, ad infinitum. Um, and moreover, shamanic incantation is an extremely culturally important discourse form in this area. Most older men master a large number of incantations. So again, it's not unique to one or two people. It's the, the domain of most older men in these communities. It's something that people think about a lot. They make reference to a lot. It's very important in their daily lives. So it's a specialized discourse form, but it's hardly um, inaccessible to, to most of the people in the community. It's very accessible. And this is an example of, an, of a piece of an incantation that was um, that was we documented in collaboration with um, Ponciano Saluciano Hamos, whose picture is here, who is a very, very knowledgeable um, incantation specialist. Um, so most older men have some genre or have some repertoire of incantations. Um, he has a really large number of them. Um, and as you can see in this text, he's he's basically exploring different kinds of trees that are associated with, with spines or splinters. He starts in the lower river. He lists all the trees that are encountered in the lower river that have spines. He moves up into the, the upper part of the river, the headwaters. He continues to list trees that have spines in that region. Then he says, if the spell still isn't effective, then he moves into the forest. So we're talking about a kind of metaphysical shamanic movement to engage with all these different kinds of trees that could generate the spine that's injuring the, the victim, that's understood shamanically to be injuring the victim. So he goes up into the forest and here he lists all the trees that have very hard wood that could be plausible sources of a spine that could bring illness to someone. Um, so I'll just give you a sense of what the incantation sounds like. Okay. So it's important to point out as well that incantation in the Upper Hio Negro region, again, that's that's entirely structured around these taxonomic sets of animals and plants that are invoked in these elaborated sets. Um, this is again a widespread feature of shamanic discourse in across the whole region. So Jonathan Hill has documented Arawakan Malikai chants, where just very much like what we saw in the hoop case, these are structured around lists of flora and fauna terms according to taxonomically organized sets. And then the terms end up get re, getting redistributed among sets as part of the shamanic work. Desana incantation. So Desana is part of the East Tucanoan family. Um, Dominique Bichelet worked with Desana incantation and pointed out that again, 
The incantation involves invoking animals and plants and so on that are relevant to the illness and to the cure, um, and also in lists and, uh, and sets of terms. So very much like what we see in the hoop case. And in my own experience, talking to people in this region, um, it's very, very common that, for example, if a Tukanoan person is visiting a hoop community, that that if it's an older man, especially, he'll join the, the group of older hoop men in the evening who sit around in the evening and discuss incantations. Um, so even though the performance of the incantation itself is not really a public event, these discussions that go on every night focus on incantations and how to best structure a given incantation for a given illness or threat that the community is facing. So these are very salient, very shared, very much accessible to, to people throughout the region. And so therefore I argue a reasonable place to expect um, to be a source for lexical calcing. So one more example, um, actually being able to identify grammatical change that might have its source in specialized discourse, again, poses some big challenges. Um, but I think there's there's a, a few examples that we can point to where it really seems like a grammatical change is um, being initiated in specialized discourse. Um, one example of this comes from Hoop um, and involves evidentials and tense marking. So in the Hoop language, like as is the case for other languages in the Northwest, uh, in the upper Rio Negro region, there is a pretty um, extensive system of evidential markers so that mark where your information is coming from, whether you learned about this thing um, by seeing it, by hearing it or something without seeing it, by inferring it, whether somebody told you. Um, in Hoop, it seems pretty clear from the historical work that I've done on the language that the evidential system is for the most part not very old and that it's emerged in the language through contact. Um, presumably part of that relative newness of the system is associated with the fact that the markers are not in fact grammatically obligatory, they're pragmatically obligatory, you could say, um, and they're very, very common, they're very ubiquitous in discourse, but they're not grammatically obligatory and they're not fused with other values. So in other words, you just have the evidential marker on its own. It's not a portmanteau marker involving tense or something else. Um, at the same time, tense marking also is pretty limited in hoop. So you do have a recent remote past tense distinction, which also I would argue has come about through contact with Tukanoan languages. Um, and this can be marked, but it's also optional. You don't have to mark it. Thank you. Um, in neighboring Tukanoan languages, evidentials are obligatorily fused with temporal values, as well as person and gender, in portmanteau and obligatory verbal suffixes, like the one you see in this example. Long ago, it said the tortoise killed the tapir. Okay, so hoop has evidentials and tense, but doesn't normally, doesn't use them very um, consistently. Tukanoan requires you to use a fused evidential tense suffix on your verb. Now, if we look at traditional stories in hoop and myths, uh, as we saw earlier, we see that in fact, practically all clauses are within this discourse genre, get the reported evidential directly followed by the direct past marker, dam or dam. And it's really interesting that within this genre, you tend to get these two elements in this order really consistently through many of these narratives. Um, in one dialect in the upper Chiquier River, the two, these two elements have become phonologically fused. So first of all, you have a discourse form that, that, that pushes you to put these things together all the time. And given the frequency of that co-occurrence, in one dialect, they've turned into one element. So you got mam to one got maha. Rather than ma tiam, you get mam. In the forest, they say long ago, he wandered following the tape here. So the argument here is that, or what seems to be the, the case here is that we have a portmanteau tense and evidentiality morpheme that's developing in this one hoop dialect that's 
conforms to an East Tucanoan model, but it's restricted to this one evidential and one tense marker out of a larger set of possibilities. Um, and effectively still within this one discourse genre. So I would argue that what we're seeing here is effectively a contact generation, a contact driven generation of a kind of portmanteau tense and evidentiality element, but that we can see that it, it seems to be um, emerging through these discourse norms, which in this case, um, incipient, the most incipient form seems to be in, um, in traditional narrative. Okay, so I will conclude. Um, so as Meyerhoff and Streicher have observed, it's in particular communities of practice that we have synchronic individual variation that's transformed or mapped into community-wide diachronic processes of change. In Amazonia, as I've argued here, Specialized discourse has a potentially significant role in shaping language contact and change, such that, as we've seen, we have diffuse, wide-reaching networks that are particularly relevant to specialized discourse and discourse discursive specialists, like shamans. There's an extra value that's ascribed to linguistically distinct or exotic forms. We have discourse traditions that favor close replication but at the same time, license creative manipulation. And we have an association of social status with key practitioners on the basis of their age, knowledge, and related skill sets. So I would argue that similar dynamics may be associated with specialized discourse um, and may be relevant within different local sociocultural frameworks in many traditional societies or many societies in general, um, but especially more traditional societies that have um, a kind of dedicated infrastructure associated with specialized discourse forms and people who, who deliver them. So I, my concluding point here is that there are certain social factors and contexts that may have been particularly key in guiding language contact and change throughout human history. But if we just focus on the kinds of well-studied social variables like gender and socioeconomic class in understanding language variation and change, um, we have to ask whether these really give us adequate predictive power to understand these processes as they've applied to human societies across space and time. And we need to consider what other variables might also be, be widely relevant or have been widely relevant in the past. And as I've argued here, um, traditional speech forms and practices may in fact be a really important place to think about this question. And I thank you very much for listening and I will end here. Thank you, Patin. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thanks very much. Yes, sure, thank you. Also for the perfect timing, we have time for questions. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, this is Andrei Kibrick speaking. Thank you very much, Petty, for uh, delivering this talk. It was uh, extremely interesting and also contributes very much to our conference being really international. Yeah, uh, Timur is telling me to move. Which way? I can see you no. now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah, I have uh, uh, probably one comment and one question. Um, uh, I'll start with a question. Uh, at some point, you mentioned the avoidance characteristic of uh, some kind of avoidance strategy characteristic of the shaman's uh, speech. Can you elaborate a little bit on what what this avoidance is due to taboo or something like that, or what, why would, would it happen? Sure, yeah. So there are several kinds of dynamics that come into play. So when somebody is hunting, um, there's a, a wide, pretty widely held belief that you're engaging not just with the animal you're hunting, but you know, I guess as one might expect with that animal's spirit and potentially with the spirits of 
animal masters that are kind of like spiritual chiefs, I guess you could say, of of animal groups and that allow those animals to go forth into the forest. Um, so in the process of hunting, one has to be very aware of those spiritual presences and very kind of careful about how one engages with them. Um, so the by not pronouncing the name of the animal, it's one way to to navigate that that you know that need for caution. So either to not anger the spirit, or to um, you know engage in other kinds of of ways of interacting with those spirits that are seen to be um, more beneficial to the hunt. Um, so that's that's one of the main things that drives those that appear apparently that drives those hunting registers. Um, there also seems to be a widespread belief in Amazonia that um, very, very interesting. It's described a lot in the ethnographic literature, but um, a sense that if you engage too closely with members of another another kind of way of being, whether these be another human group or an animal group or a spirit group, that you risk being absorbed into that group. And so language tends to come into play here as well. And I've argued in other things that I think this may be a factor for um, for helping to encourage language maintenance in that if you shift to another language, you're effectively being absorbed into that group. So I think the hunting registers may have something to do with that as well, and that you have to be very careful how you speak to members of another group. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers. Yeah, thanks. And my other comment is uh, related to, to a term or expression uh, discourse specialists. I think that's what you said about shamans and other ritual, uh, ritual uh, performing performers. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, it, it parallels to the role of uh, writers or poets in the literature center societies, which also may drive change. And uh, once in a while, what they invent becomes a part of the general language. Uh, uh, so it's it's a very interesting observation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's an important point. On one hand, it's tempting to emphasize the differences between our societies, more yeah. contemporary <laughs> urban societies. But in fact, there are a lot of the same dynamics at play. Thank you. Okay, thanks once again for accepting our invitation and for giving you this wonderful talk. Yeah. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you. Any other questions? Maybe from Zoom? No? Uh, Thank you for your wonderful talk. My question is more personal. Have you um, have you ever taken part in those shamanic incantations only as an observer or as an active participant? And if there's any difference between the two, if you have, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, absolutely. So in 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 the Northwest Amazon region, as I mentioned, shamanic incantation is is just an extremely important part of life there. Um, that said, I think people have for a long time been been very cautious about revealing much of that to outsiders um, because of a history of um, of you know that that part of their lives being really degraded and put down by missionaries and um, and other outsiders. Um, but having spent quite a bit of time in the community and um, you know, effectively gained gained the trust of, of many members of the community and, and established a long a long relationship. Um, I've become more and more able to to be part of those things within a pretty short time of being in the community um, of spending time in the community. Um, I was already you know well engaged in in participating in that kind of of life with them. So um, the very first time that that it that I was able to participate was when I myself got sick um, and I was there by myself. Um, so, you know, very much sort of established within the community social structure and an elder in the community um, offered to to do an incantation for me to. Um, oh, sorry. One second. Tasha, I'm going to talk, sweetie. You can take Marie for a walk. Sorry, it's my daughter. <laughs> um. So, so yeah, I've I've been the recipient of an incantation, and then since then have um, you know benefited from the incantation 
um, knowledge of the elders in the community many times. I took my son there once when he was small and he got sick. And um, so he was given an incantation um, cure. And um, and then more recently, become I've gotten more engaged in documenting them, working together with um, specialist elders who have recognized that it's difficult, it's becoming more difficult for young people to learn the whole incantation um, repertoires, I think for you know complicated reasons that are associated with cultural change. Um, and so they become much more, the elders have become much more invested in working together with myself and an anthropologist colleague to, to document the, the incantation. So, so yeah, I've been able to engage with it on various levels. And it's a very, very rich and beautiful um, form of verbal art and kind of an encyclopedic knowledge of, of the, the ecosystem and everything around it. So thank you for your question. I will talk to you in a minute. I'm very busy, but no. So another question. Olga Kozakiewicz. Well, thank you very much for your brilliant talk, most interesting. And I wonder if all that shamanic, uh, all these shamanic traditional traditions are quite alive. I mean, uh, what about education interfering into it, uh, into the communities? What about language shift and how? Do they coexist? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. So um, it's a very important question. Um, within this region, there's variation across communities with respect to how much engagement those communities have had with um, the outside world. Sorry, one minute. Sasha, is there any use your rainbow? Yes, of course. Please don't, don't come in here yet. Sorry, it's a Saturday and kids are around. Um, so. So there's variation, um, but in in communities, especially that have had a longer history of interactions with um, priests and other missionaries, um, in many cases, the incantation tradition effectively died out in those communities, but it still re remains so vibrant in parts of the region that had less interaction. And I think there's enough potential for people to move around and learn from each other that um, that it's far from lost. And in the communities where I go that are more remote and have had a much shorter period of interaction with the outside, um, the tradition has still remained very vibrant. But as I mentioned, the elders, even in those communities, are concerned that young people are not learning the tradition in the way that they had in the past, um, which is one of the reasons why they have, um, you know, effectively been, been, very, very eager to work with myself and my colleague to document the tradition. So it's very strong on one hand, but it's definitely endangered on the other. And in some communities, even more so than the ones that I work in. So thank you for your question. Uh, let me also ask you a question. Well, first, I would like to mention that uh, as far as I understand what you said about the use of well, so to say, foreign languages by shamans has parallels in northern Eurasia as well, including languages of Russia. But I'm not a specialist here, just I'd like to mention that. And my question concerns your example about parallelism in the name or names of trees. You showed that in one of the languages, I think of the Nadafu family, there is a parallelism in these names with the Inga trees or something like that. And in another uh, related language, there is no such parallelism. They have, it has its own inventory of names. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what is your explanation of that? Why this other, the second language doesn't show the same parallelism? Is it because, well, well probably in the first language, uh, this language copied the names of trees from an unrelated language, right? Uh -huh. The second language didn't copy that, that system. Why? Is it because a language just doesn't have to copy? This is nothing, there is nothing deterministic about that. Or because for the second language, the rate of shared, uh, well, specialized discourse is lower. 
what what yeah. is your explanation for that yeah thank you that's a great question and i didn't because of of time constraints i didn't have time to give the full context so the tentative explanation that i would give is that the hoop calcing of flora and fauna terms is it seems to me very plausibly associated with the fact that in the incantations the whole the purpose of the incantations or the focus of the incantations is to keep creating more and more elaborate sets of these flora and fauna types right so if say you have a kind of tree in the incantation part of that genre is pushing you to elaborate that type into more and more sub variants so if we compare for example types of inga tree in hoop and in doe doe is outside of the the primary contact zone where so it's a little bit difficult to say because Do and Nadeb, the two Nadahoop languages that are outside the Valpez contact zone, um, the, the other languages, the other indigenous languages in those areas are much less strong now because of language loss over time and the impact of the colonial regime over time. Um, so it's hard to know what the situation was there in the past. Where Hoop is spoken within the Valpez, there's still a very vibrant contact zone lots of contact with Tucano. My understanding of the, inc the incantation tradition in the Valpez zone where Hoop is located is that it's very strong, very shared, really focusing on this elaborate division of, of entities into sets. Whereas Doe is more on the periphery, Doe certainly had an incantation tradition. It's been almost completely exterminated by missionaries. But in the little snippets that we've been able to record, myself and colleagues, um, it seems that it's it does relate to flora and fauna, but we have not been able to determine any evidence in those small pieces that it relies on the same kind of elaboration of sets the way we see in the a little further up the river. Um, so my argument would be that, well, so one observation is that if you compare, say, words for the types of ingatri in Do and Hoop, there are many more terms in Hoop to begin with and they parallel the Tucano, the Tucanoan forms in terms of these binomial calcs. Whereas Doe, I would argue, if it, if indeed it had less access to this incantation tradition that's, that's encouraging you to, to make these more and more elaborated sets, it would have less reason to develop more and more and more binomial terms and less opportunity to calc them from these other languages. But it's difficult to know for sure because the historical situation has been different in those regions and we don't know nearly as much about the Doe incantation tradition over time. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, it seems we don't have any more questions and we don't have any more time and your daughter is waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you once again, Patty, for a wonderful talk. Hope to see you here someday i hope so yeah okay. thank you thank very you. much i really appreciate the invitation and i wish you all the very best for your conference thank you goodbye okay. goodbye thank you Наверное, уже не в качестве ведущего, а просто в качестве экс-ведущего. Передаю слово. Да, ну что же, дорогие коллеги, давайте перейдем прямо сразу к, к процедуре закрытия нашего форума. Есть о чем сказать. Я так понимаю, у нас банкет будет прямо в этом помещении, да? Я имею в виду, что нам нужно энергично провести наше закрытие, чтобы оставить время тем коллегам, которые будут заниматься организацией, организацией вот физического пространства здесь в зале. Ну, у нас по плану 20 минут, по-моему, сейчас стараемся в них и уложиться. Когда мы обдумывали, какую взять тему э, лингвистического форума в этом году, 
что э, э, было придумано связать форум с годом культурного наследия, который отмечается в этом году в России. Я должен сказать, что эту идею э, изобрела Анна Владимировна Данилина, присутствующая здесь. Э, и мы эту идею в дальнейшем развили. Ну, когда думаешь о культурном наследии в области языка, ну, конечно, в первую очередь вспоминается фольклор или фольклор, я не знаю, как правильно произносить, и так, и так говорят. Но мы решили взять несколько более расширенный подход, не только фольклор в узком смысле, но и другие традиционные формы, которые могут быть вполне авторскими, но тоже от этого не перестающие быть традиционными. Ну и кроме форм еще и практики. Мы в программном комитете в свое время долго обсуждали названия. Ну вот решили, что формы – это, так сказать, шаблоны, такие схемы, жанры, если угодно, а практики – это более такой прагматический подход, вот что люди делают в традиционных контекстах коммуникативных. Ну и кроме того, здесь еще есть другое расширение, которое было, мне кажется, хорошо реализовано, связанное с современными трансформациями традиционных практик. То есть не только старина, но и то, что с этой стариной сейчас люди делают. Вот такова получилась концепция этой конференции. Ну, мне кажется, что это было удачно. У нас было... Три пленарных доклада, которые, мне кажется, хорошо друг друга дополняли. Они так были сбалансированы и по, так сказать, национальному происхождению спикеров, и по возрасту, и по гендеру. В общем, у нас все очень гармонично. У нас было два доклада, первые два по порядку, которые были, так, носили такой общий характер. Один из них был взгляд на фольклор с точки зрения лингвиста, а второй взгляд на фольклор с точки зрения фольклориста. И нам и то, и другое было важно. Естественно, нас э, интересуют немножко другие вещи, чем непосредственно фольклористов, но материал вот в данном случае такой, как, как, как фольклористов. И эти перспективы, если их внимательно сравнивать и сопоставлять, то они, конечно, друг друга дополняют. Ну и сегодня у нас был третий пленарный доклад, только что он был более специализированный по, и по теме, и по региону, и вот погрузились мы под конец в эту э, амазонскую экзотику, но которая в то же время обнаружит некоторые параллели с тем, что нам известно по другим регионам, по другим темам. Да, э, спасибо большое программному комитету, который активно обсуждал э, персоны с, э, пленарных докладчиков, особенно тем коллегам, кто этих людей при, предложили, пригласили. Это очень было удачно. У нас было 16 секций, но я не буду называть все их названия. Некоторые из них были, названия были такие экспериментальные, например, иллокутивные жанры. Но вроде никто не ругался, оказалось, что название вроде бы подходит. Понятно, что это имеет, имеется в виду. Но некоторые названия секции, конечно, были немного с натяжкой. У нас были такие очень общие названия, типа методология. Вот. Но тоже от этого никто не пострадал. Достаточно, мне кажется, логично в целом это все раз по то, что у нас было в результате отбора получено. Достаточно логично распалась на секции. Мне кажется, что секционные доклады проходили на весьма достойном научном уровне. И здесь я еще раз хочу поблагодарить программный комитет, который занимался вот этой изнурительной работой по рецензированию. Мы, как я уже говорил в начале, мы отобрали менее половины от поданных заявок. То есть очень был такой суровый отбор, ну и это, и, собственно, и обеспечило достаточно высокий уровень нашего обсуждения на конференции. У нас в том коллективе, вот, который здесь сложился, участников, у нас очень разные здесь представлены люди и по поколениям, и по направлениям. 
и, кроме того, и междисциплинарность явно имеет место, что, что вообще в науке всегда полезно. То есть, мне кажется, очень интересный был набор докладов. А, ну, у нас было в самый последний момент два или три выпадения докладов э, из программы. Э, но это всегда бывает, кто-то не сумел прилететь, кто-то просто куда-то исчез. Но поскольку их было всего два или три, то это не разрушило нашу программу, а в целом все состоялось э, хорошо. Э, при составлении секции мы стремились к тому, чтобы э, перемешивать доклады. То есть да, секции были собраны в каком-то смысле по сходству тематическому, но э, людей, представляющих э, э, очень близкие подходы, скорее мы старались помещать в разные секции, чтобы люди встречались в рамках секции ну, с альтернативами, по сравнению с тем, что им привычно. Мне кажется, это хорошо. У нас было в общей сложности, как мне сообщила Таня Давидюк, 79 докладов, ну и по совпадению также 79 участников, хотя это не обязательно должно совпадать, но вот совпадает. И... Как, опять же, Таня мне подсказала, можно, можно считать, что участников было 80, потому что на одной, на круглом столе еще присутствовал плюшевый медведь, которого принесла Екатерина Борисовна Яковенко. С очных докладов было 46. Ну и да, вот был очень популярный круглый стол. Вчера он проходил в течение всего дня, но я через несколько минут дам слово организаторам круглого стола, чтобы они нам кратко рассказали об итогах. Ну, что можно сказать о, еще о содержании, содержании наших обсуждений? Я думаю, что это, серьезный анализ потребует времени, но пара мыслей, которые мне передали руководители секции, тем не менее, может быть названа. Значит, есть тема, очевидная тема в контексте нашей конференции о, о том, в чем особенности фольклорных текстов, в отличие от других жанров. Вот есть ощущение, что над этим еще думать и думать. Вот это была одна, одна из главных тем, но не всегда она была достаточно освещена в тех, в тех докладах, где это можно было бы ожидать. Ну, пожалуй, да, другие мысли на еще менее зрелые. Надо будет действительно подумать, потом вернуться к этому. У нас, конечно, было не очень много, не всегда было много людей в аудиториях, иногда даже прям-таки прям мало. Ну, это результат, вот, видимо, гибридного режима, на который мы пошли. И часто в Зуме было больше участников, чем, собственно, в зале. Ну, тем самым мы даже не желая того, продолжали соблюдать санитарные требования из ковидных времен. Андрей Владимирович Сидельцев, который является председателем оргкомитета э, этой конференции, ну и он входил в программный комитет, тоже, в общем, является одним из ключевых людей, которые все это э, создавали, э, смело сказал, что мы на этот гибридный формат идем. Я, конечно, э, очень опасался, потому что трудности, которые есть отдельно в очном формате и в дистанционным, они здесь как-то накладываются, мультиплицируются, возникает такой эффект резонанса, но тем не менее оргкомитет во главе с Андреем Владимировичем э, триумфально одолел э, гибридный формат. Э, если какие-то сбои были, то э, мало их было. Спасибо большое. Э, ну, в данном случае особенно, конечно, нашим специалистам компьютерным Ивану Васильевичу и Сергею э, Валерьевичу. Да. И, и Дмитрию Коломадскому тоже, который оказывал поддержку вчера. А, вообще, э, в целом, э, большое спасибо за все, не только за, за гибридность, но и за все. 
за все, за все, всему оргкомитету и вообще всем коллегам из института, которые оказывали поддержку Анне Владимировне, разумеется, и техническому нашему хозяйственному отделу во главе с Олегом Сипелевым. Все люди из этого подразделения тут присутствовали. И, и даже не только. И у нас и даже сотрудники бухгалтерии помогали во время. И отдела кадров. Это, можно сказать, практически революция такая в истории института. Ну, разумеется, Таня Давидюк, которая была в центре вообще всей подготовки. Огромное спасибо вам, Таня, за прекрасную, четкую работу и, и э, доброжелательность и терпение во всех ситуациях. Во все, и во, как вчера в одном докладе был, в любое время суток. А, у нас была, мне кажется, хорошая атмосфера коллегиальная на конференции, что тоже очень важно. Не всегда так бывает, надо сказать. В, в моей практике я разные видел. Иногда вдруг какая-то во время дискуссии какая-то агрессивность проявляется. Но вот этого здесь совсем не было. Было очень все время все хорошо и приятно. Огромное спасибо председателям всех секций. Это неблагодарная такая работа быть председателем секции, вместо того, чтобы вдумываться в научную суть докладов, ты вынужден все время смотреть на часы и в качестве такого цербера вот постоянно дергать докладчика, который вдохновленно с трибуны что-то вещает, затыкать ему рот. Но кто-то это должен делать. Спасибо большое. Ну и самое главное спасибо, я думаю, всему корпусу докладчиков, всех участников конференции, можно иметь прекрасную организационную структуру, но если не будет участников, конференция не состоится. Спасибо большое всем. На одном из лингвистических форумов, а именно на втором, который был в 2020 году, возникла такая инициатива издать труды конференции Proceedings, то, что называется. И вышло даже, получилось даже два сборника. Один из них вышел в том же году, в очень таком престижном издании. Вернее, на следующий год, извините, все-таки не в 20 а в 21 году. Англоязычное было издание. Ну, там была редколлегия инициативная, которая отобрала сама по своему усмотрению часть докладов, потом еще было рецензирование. Вот. И еще второй сборник э, статей тоже э, сформирован, но он, правда, до сих пор не вышел, были ряд, ряд задержек, но вот в ближайшее время вроде бы должен появиться. И э, я предлагаю подумать и в этом случае также о э, таком издании, но для этого нужна инициативная редколлегия. Если среди членов программного комитета есть пара-тройка людей, которые готовы этим заняться, то давайте это обсудим. Но я еще отдельно напишу в рассылку всего программного комитета, потому что не все здесь присутствуют. Наверное, это стоит сделать, если, если такая инициатива проявится. Ну и в заключение... Тут, когда мы, просто небольшой, небольшая цитата, мы когда рекламировали эту конференцию, то было создано две версии пресс-релиза. Был официальный и был такой менее официальный. Андрей Владимирович, по-моему, вы писали, да? Но я не буду целиком, целиком зачитывать, но тут говорится о том, что в ходе конференции вы освоите структуру проклятия и благословений. Узнаете, что писали в табличках против воров в Римской Британии. Научитесь правильно употреблять исконное русское слово «вербохлест». Станете знатоком народных примет в телевизионном дискурсе и узнаете, как послать к черту на, на чистом ирландском языке. Узнали. Все оказалось реально, все получилось. Ну, я еще раз благодарю всех, кто участвовал в да, да, да. Я, я от себя благодарю всех участников и всех организаторов. 
И передаю слово теперь Татьяне Борисовне или Лили Рахимовне. А они потом передают слово Андрею Владимировичу, я думаю. Хорошо. Когда мы все это затевали, мы, конечно, понимали, что фигура медведя отнюдь не периферийна, но когда мы получили огромное количество тезисов, то мы... Они, на самом деле количество участников превзошло все наши даже самые смелые ожидания. Как выяснилось, медвежьей тематикой занимается очень большое количество лингвистов. И был очень жесткий отбор, после которого осталось 22 доклада. 21 прозвучал, один участник, ну, наша вина, конечно, участник в Якутске был, и он уже заснул просто. У него было... Да, ну, ну, как положено, <смех> в гибернацию, да. <смех> ну, у него был уже первый час ночи, и, в общем, он не виноват. А, ну, и все равно, и, и без него было очень много хороших, замечательных, прекрасных докладов. Мы узнали в процессе, что еще живы... Медвежьи речевые практики. Там, где они не живы, ну, медведь оставил свой неизгладимый лексический след в лексических системах этих языков. И там, где нет уже живых речевых практик, есть еще медвежьи речевые формы. Вполне себе. И мы поняли, на самом деле, что вообще существует медвежий дискурс. Вот мы не побоимся этого слова. Это что-то такое дискурс, который отличает вот то, что говорится о медведе, вокруг медведя, отличает от всех прочих дискурсов. Там от, от имени медведя мы много интересного узнали. И есть, оказывается, медвежьи речевые формы по разным языкам в разных ареалах каким-то чудесным образом, то ли заимствованы, то ли... Ну, а может, это вообще типологическая черта, кто знает. Вот правше это что? Это заимствование, Ольга Анатольевна? Мы же не знаем, да? Или это типология? Ну, в общем, что-то такое. А, вот. Огромное спасибо всем-всем-всем докладчикам. Огромное спасибо Ивану Васильевичу, без которого вообще это все было бы... Ну, если бы и было бы, то не так. Не так хорошо. Вот. И у нас на самом деле возникла идея сделать публикацию по вот этому столу круглому, но теперь мы, наверное, хотим влиться в общую часть. Вот Андрей Александрович сказал, что вы, что, может быть, сделаем издание трудов, тогда круглый стол. Мы особняком не хотим стоять, мы хотим вместе. Да, да. В общем, ну, это, мы хотим это обсуждать. Спасибо большое. И да, и мы передаем теперь что Андрей Владимирович, спасибо. Дорогие коллеги, у меня техническая просьба и объявление. Вот там председатель оргкомитета. Мы очень просим вас пойти на первый, на третий этаж. Нам нужно это место и нам коридор. Погуляйте, пожалуйста. Посмотрите институт языка знания. Вот. Таблички на дверях. Буквально 15 минут, коллеги. Но заметьте, что нам понадобится вот эта часть коридора. Мы можем немножко вас задеть, если что-то будет. Мы вас 